Picture this. It's 1998. You're playing this brand new shooter, and so far, you're having a lot of fun. You've reached a part of the game called We've Got Hostiles. The game has been building up to the military for quite a while now. Hey, what the hell are you doing down here? Get topside! I hear troops are coming in to save us. And you're starting to see their bodies littered around the place. They're supposed to save you from this hellish facility, and you know it'll be nice to have a better ally than this guy. Unfortunately, you don't know yet that the soldiers in this game are the bad guys. And if you were to run up to one and they shot at you before you've realized what's going on, it might feel a little bit unfair. So how does Half-Life make sure that you know this guy isn't going to be your friend like this guy? Rescued at last, thank God you're here. Oh, well there you go. Just like that, there's no ambiguity. You know you're not getting an easy way out of this. The stakes just rose that much higher. When Half-Life released in 1998, it was unlike any other video game before it. Its revolutionary status was a result of many factors, but the single most important was the way the game presented its storyline. As that example illustrated, the story of Half-Life is incredibly important to its progression, setting it apart from other action games of the time. It would have been more than enough to simply give players a compelling story at all, but for Valve, more than enough still isn't enough. Half-Life goes to great lengths to ensure that every part of the plot is engaging, experienced by the player, seamlessly tied to gameplay, and presents the entire thing in first person. The result is an experience only possible in a video game, and one that very few games manage to capture quite so well. In order to illustrate this, we're going to be looking at the first three chapters of the game, and explain how the story told in them enriches the gameplay. Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This automated train is provided for the security and convenience of the Black Mesa Research Facility personnel. Half-Life begins like any workday does, with a long and tedious commute. Now, playing this game for the 10th, 20th, 100th time, this chapter can get a bit boring. But for a first playthrough, Inbound does everything it needs to to set the stage. You are Gordon Freeman, a theoretical physicist at the Black Mesa Research Facility, on your way to Sector C. The game shows everything. Black Mesa is like Area 51 if it were privatized, worth a few extra billion dollars, and every conspiracy theory about it were true. The tram ride serves purposes aside from world building too. It allows the player to become acquainted with the controls, which may have been necessary at the time. See, Half-Life was one of the first games to use WASD by default, a control layout popularized by Dennis Fong, winner of the first National Quake Tournament and this Ferrari. Once the player leaves the tram, they're given full control to go anywhere they want. And when they step into the lobby, the player is given their objective in a simple conversation. Hey, Mr. Freeman. I had a bunch of messages for you, but we had a system crash about 20 minutes ago, and I'm still trying to find my files. Just one of those days, I guess. They were having some problems down in the test chamber, too, but I think that's all straightened out. They told me to make sure you headed down there as soon as you got into your hazard suit. Or, if you don't care, you can just keep on going. When speaking to scientists, it becomes clear that nobody wants anything to do with you, probably because you're late. Aren't you supposed to be in the test chamber half an hour ago? A very simple way to let the developers get away with minimal voice acting. You can mess with the alarms, people's emails, the microwave, vending machines, most objects that seem like they should be interactable are. The game gives a reason for the player's ability to take all sorts of damage, the HEV suit, which is also necessary to enter the test chamber to perform the experiment, which is necessary to give a reason for the enemies to exist, and in order to give the player a fighting chance against these enemies, they needed to add the HEV suit, which explains how the player can take so much damage. Welcome to the HEV Mark IV Protective System for use in hazardous environment conditions. High impact reactive armor activated. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Anomalous Materials leads the player through a mostly linear path through the facility with only a few minor detours. Throughout, the game builds tension. Today isn't exactly an ordinary day. Things are going wrong, machinery isn't working, and scientists aren't terribly confident. 
now, now, if you follow standard insertion procedures, everything will be fine. I don't know how you can say that, although I will admit that the possibility of a resonance cascade scenario is extremely unlikely. Gordon doesn't need to hear all this. He's a highly trained professional. This culminates in the experiment, which of course goes horribly wrong. The Resonance Cascade is the single most important event in the entire series, and the most important in this game's story. It shows you the chaos, and explains much of the destruction that will serve as the game's obstacles. It gives you a glimpse of the horrors to come, and most importantly, it places you right in the center of the action. Now let's compare to another game for a second. How does Doom start? Yeah, okay, so if you didn't read the manual, you really don't have an idea of what's going on here. There's just no explanation given in the game itself. The Doom guy is here to clean up somebody else's mess. And as we've seen from recent entries into the series, that can make for some very compelling and interesting action on its own. But Half-Life makes this incredibly personal. As a result, the next chapter hits hard. Unforeseen Consequences is the journey back through the Anomalous Materials Laboratory, a marvel of both storytelling and game design. This place that felt entirely ordinary just minutes before is now a nightmare. People are dead on the ground, equipment is falling apart, scientists are in despair, and monsters are invading. From a storytelling perspective, Unforeseen Consequences' reuse of the last chapter's layout gives the player a real sense of investment, an ability to compare and contrast this world before and after the Cascade in a way that wouldn't be possible if the game began partway through the invasion. And from a gameplay perspective, it reveals just how purposeful everything in this game is. Each and every section that the player saw in Anomalous Materials is given an entirely new purpose. This room used to explain the story, now it's a timing challenge. A route that was previously closed off to the player... You got the wrong airlock, Mr. Freeman. You know I can't let you through here is now the new way to go, and the place you came from is a minor secret with another fun sequence. You are able to see all of these hazards as normal parts of the facility. It makes this location feel like a real place, and every danger for the remainder of the game is presented as an element of the world that has become unsafe after the Cascade. It seems so simple and seamless, but you can really see the attention to detail that went into every little thing. The whole game presents its story in the same way. When a new objective is introduced, it's done with an NPC informing the player of it. Mister, you can get the power on. That train will take us straight to the surface. I would try it myself, but it's a long way down the generator room, and there are things in the way. Danger is telegraphed with scripted scenes. The story is used to explain the presence of soldiers for the majority of the game, which provides some of the best combat encounters, and it's used to explain why the soldiers leave. The player loses their weapons about halfway through after an ambush, and this allows the game to make the player feel unsafe for a chapter or two, before ramping back up into its strongest action. Oh, and by the way, throughout all of this, all of it, you're in control. Well, except for here, but that's okay, that's the point of this part, we'll talk about it later. For the entire game, the player gets to choose who lives and who dies. Maybe a scientist makes some kind of stupid comment? With my brains and your brawn, we'll make an excellent team. Well, they're dead. The game doesn't punish you for this with a load screen. Well, except for when it does, but you kinda need to make compromises on that in certain situations. For most of the game, if you shoot an NPC, your punishment is their reaction. Maybe you lose out on some weaponry, maybe they fight back. It's a type of freedom that I've honestly never seen in another game, not even Half-Life sequels. Every now and then the 
It's captured and sent back information, but we don't have a complete picture of the place. The little we do know- When the game embeds the player and their actions so deep into this story and world, it provides an experience truly unique to games. This is Half-Life's greatest strength, and the reason these games are held in such high esteem. For God's sake, open the silo door! They're coming for us! It's our only way out! Oh my God, we're doomed! Do but of course, a novel approach to storytelling can't sustain an entire game on its own. If the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay isn't fun, people will drop it after an hour at most. So that's what we'll be covering next time, Half-Life's gameplay progression. We'll be looking at its enemies and weapons, as well as what the player does outside of combat. Thank you very much for checking this episode out. I will see you up ahead.